following message is transmitted. All right. Welcome to the Order of Chaos podcast. The Order of Chaos is a no-holds-barred discussion on the topics of metaphysics, spirituality, and the occult. And today my guest is Lauren Davis. Lauren is a left-hand path practitioner and founder of the Coven of Ashes, a Dark Ambient Sound Bath, and her latest venture, SuGenerousMagica.com. And the links to all of those will be down in the episode description. Uh, welcome, Lauren. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to cover here. You have a, you have a lot of projects and a lot, yeah, of, a lot of cool things going on. And I'm <laughs> very excited to hear about all of them. But, but before we get into your projects, I just want to ask, you know, because I'm so interested, how did you get involved with Left Hand Path Magic? And, and really, how did you get involved with spirituality and the occult in the first place? Um, I mean, spirituality in the first place started when I was a little girl. Um, I was just really interested in the paranormal because I was having experiences and I didn't really know what to do with those um, aside from just being afraid. So um, I, I got a lot of, I would check out a lot of books on that and then that led me to getting a lot of um, books on just other cultures and other religious philosophies. Um, at a really, really young age and uh, got to the point where my curiosity um, really started peaking and I would come with these, like come home with these stacks of books and my dad would just get furious and slam down the Bible and just be like, this is the only book you need to be reading. And I was just, I thought that was just so ass backwards um, as far, and even as a little kid, I was just like, this doesn't, why would you want to keep me from education? I don't understand that. So, um, you know, I challenged him. Um, I was a really precocious kid. So I challenged him. I was like, okay, you want to do the Christian thing. Why don't you get up every fucking Sunday morning and let's fucking do this. So I forced my parents to get up and go. I found a church and, um, going to that church, I actually found what I, I was moved by certain things. And what I was getting from that was that I had a sense of community. And that was more important to me than the things that they were preaching. Um, so eventually, my parents stopped going. And I had established relationships with like, the pastors and the pastor's wife and uh, other people in, in the band and stuff like that. And you know, slowly but surely I kind of faded away because I didn't really agree with the things that they were talking about. But I did recognize that this is this feeling is way more than just about this book, about this mythology. This has to do with my sense of being accepted and having that sense of family. And so I started to kind of look at that in other cultures and other religions and eventually just started telling my dad, oh yeah, this is for school. Like he wouldn't argue with it if it was for school, but you know, I couldn't read for pleasure. So <laughs> it was really fucked up. But um, fast forward to, uh, I don't know, high school-ish. And I got really into, uh, the first one was Ralph Waldo Emerson. And um, he just super piqued my interest. From there, it was like Nietzsche and then Jung. And uh, then I got started into Austin Osmond's Fair. So reading all of these individuals I think I, I really was trying hard to get into the Crawley stuff but it just wasn't resonating with me um, it seemed very hierarchical and I, I didn't like the way that that felt um, even reading you know the satanic bible and stuff like that I, I found a lot of things that they were saying to be super misogynistic and, um, and I just, I, I was like, yeah, I'm going to question everything. I don't agree <laughs> and I don't have to, and that's fine. But, um, when I really found out about the left-hand path, 
and that there was a left hand and a right hand. And I didn't really understand what that was about. So uh, I picked up Lords of the Left Hand Path and the way that he describes the left hand versus the right hand, I was like, this makes sense to me. This is, this, this is what resonates with me. And I didn't know what to call it. Um, but this is probably the closest thing that I'll ever find to what exactly it is that I'm digesting from all this information. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, yeah, like high school ish is where I really started getting into that. Um, of course in high school, we're all led to, you know, do some kind of rebellious act. So for me, it felt really rebellious to, um, really dive into the psychology behind spirituality because I was around a lot of people that were contradicting themselves um, and not really committing to any sort of, um, not committing to what they would um, say was important to them. Um, and that really just, you know, it rubbed me the wrong way and it just seemed really disingenuous. So I wanted to live as authentically as possible and by my terms. And when I was reading about the left-hand path, by the way, Lords of the Left-Hand Path reads like fucking stereo instructions. It is one of the hardest books to get through. Um, but it, it did make a lot of sense to me. And I was like, I think this is, I think this is it. This is what really makes sense. So went with that <laughs> awesome yeah yeah i'm um <clears throat> i don't really label myself i i'm very left hand path leaning mm -hmm. let's say that at the very least because i believe that the left hand path is the path of individual empowerment mm -hmm. and getting out of group think yeah and and i'm and, and it's the, the way for free thinkers mm -hmm. um now it depends on kind of what people have different ideas about what these things mean right like you might talk to one uh any any given person and they might tell you that the right hand path is is something like wicca or like mm -hmm. white magic yeah uh, and i call it know, white light magic <laughs> yeah uh, and and left hand path being and some people would say the left hand path that's just satanism and i think that's pretty silly i think yeah. that the real distinction is in between whether your focus is on uh your individual empowerment or on collective healing Mm -hmm. you know and 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 my point of view because i you know i'm very mixed up in the things like i would say my practice consists of the philosophy of thalema the hermetic principles mm -hmm. and chaos magic yeah uh you know and, and a mix of the things and also zen buddhism and uh, and all kinds of other things that i incorporate into my my practice but the real core of it is do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Um, mm -hmm. Love is the law, love under will. And I think that if you really take that, those st statements apart and, and follow them and follow your heart and do your best to be a good person, then, then the path of individual empowerment is the right path for you. Right. That's right. Like kind of the way I see it. But, and that, and with the hermetic principles and kind of like when you were saying with the Lords of the left-hand path, when I read the Kibalion, it was like, this is it. This mm. makes perfect sense to me. This is how I already saw the world someone just put it into these terms that, you know, are, are so uh, kind of like they were pulled out of my own mind. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Resonated with me so well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm, I love mythology and I read so many different, I mix up my mythologies. Yeah. Like yeah. They're, they're all over the place. <laughs> and that's, that's where I have like the most trouble. Um, when I was reading all of this literature growing up, the the common thread between all of it was really just like all of this shit happens in your mind all of it you don't need the accoutrement you all you need is to just have that intention so for the longest time like i was super against any like using any kind of implements it was all about meditation and just like focusing on exactly what i wanted and I, I don't think it was till I really got into uh, Austin Osmond's fair and like his way of um, entering that liminal space and automatic writing that I was like, okay, there's things that I can use that will influence my subconscious. And then I started putting that together. Yeah. Um, and then it, I mean, it really took a focus on like psychology. My mom was studying to be a psychologist as I was growing up. Um, but 
you know, she didn't end up pursuing that. But I think my love of my love and fascination for that really came from my upbringing with her and her openness, um, especially to like abnormal psychology, which is really interesting. Um, but that's again, that's like that's where the majority of my my spirituality and my belief system comes from is like, um, how can I link it back to what's going on in my head and my subconscious and what can I uncover in my unconscious, you know, mm -hmm. how do I access those things. So, um, you know, really, I feel like all of the, you know, uh, deification is, is just the accoutrement for me that took a long while for me to kind of like, really accept that into my world. It, you know, it did, okay, so it did for me as well, but it was more for me a reconciliation of, of just organizing in my brain, how does this all fit together? Mm -hmm. um, because I have a lot of fun with my mythologies and with the gods that I, I work with in my mm -hmm. practice, because that's actually the most fun part of it for me, uh, that and experiencing synchronicity, uh, which is just a blast when you know what's going on around you because mm -hmm. you've manifested it. Um, but so, so for me, studying neuroscience and psychology really opened the doors to understanding how this works. And again, uh, the hermetic principles were really key to this for me. So after a few years of just kind of pondering, like, like you, um, like what, what is this really, what's really happening here? What's in my mind and what's not? Uh, it comes down to, in my opinion, the, the phrase as above, so below, as within, so without. So I mean, really, we know that everything you experience, I mean, everything, this conversation that we're having right now is all in your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't experience the real world. You can experience a hallucination created by your brain of what's actually around you, which is the quantum field. But none right. of this is actually real. It's a type of dream. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of thought form. And that's true of all of physical reality. Mm -hmm. So if I'm holding a crystal or a wand or lighting candles, I am doing all of those things in my mind, literally by doing something physically, you are still just doing it in your mind. And when you right. can wrap your head around that concept, it all starts to like, Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I get yeah. it now. I see. What's now I can use here. these things. Yeah. Now yeah. I, now I understand the meaning behind using these things. And I, I think it was a pretty good um, foundational thought for me to just be like, yeah, I don't need that stuff. Um, and be against it for a while till I could really wrap my head around why those things were important. Yeah. Um, I think learning intent is, is, you know, a good 75% of what the hell you're doing, you know? <laughs> and um, it's important to understand also that your subconscious mind, your right brain hemisphere does not understand your logic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's non-linear. Yeah. It's the creative, random, the subconscious chaos. You know, your left brain is order, your right brain is chaos. Mm -hmm. So you've got to speak to the chaos side of your mm -hmm. consciousness and it doesn't speak language. It speaks metaphor. So you have to, when you're performing a ritual or calling, invoking a, a deity, you're just speaking to that metaphorical side of your brain yeah. that understands these things uh, in a different language mm -hmm. than your logical thinking linear left brain mind. Whatever it takes to make your logical brain figure it out, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and there are so many paths to that. Um, when we talked about, when we talked before about, like, you know, we're all kind of looking at the same thing and maybe just different faces of um, what this thing is. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many connections that you know a lot of people reject. A lot of people are scared of. Um, I know that the things that I practice and probably the things that you're practicing are frightening to people to open yourself to those things are frightening, but I look at it and I'm like, when you really break it down, it's not that fucking scary. <laughs> like this no, shit is it's all in your you. mind. It's yeah. all in your mind and it's all you, but it is scary. And I'll tell you why yeah. it's scary. Um, because magic, one of the things that it is. I never like to say this is what magic is because it's many, many things. But one of the yeah. things that it is, is experiential psychology. <clears throat> Pardon me. One of the things that it is, is experiential psychology. Mm -hmm. So rather than reading a psychology textbook and, you know, okay, I get it, right? That's how it all works. Cool. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. With magic, you have confrontational experiences with the deepest parts of your own psyche, yeah. aka yeah. your demons. 
Right. And they may, these, and these are, and this is, I think, important to understand um, when you, when you practice magic is that you are meddling with the psychic forces of your own subconscious mind and they are more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Right. And they are right. real that that reptilian part of your brain that subconscious is a quantum computer and it can do just about anything mm -hmm. um and you can you can manifest powerfully if you really know how to get in touch with that part of your mind and that's what you were doing with ritual right and with, exactly. or with sigil making or with with any magical practice you're accessing that subconscious part of your mind and those those are powerful psychic forces yeah uh, as crowley put it and this blew my mind the first time i read it the in in the goetia he says the demons of the goetia are portions of the human brain mm -hmm. the first time i read that i'll make it just like everything made sense all of a sudden yeah i got yeah. it yeah um so yeah they're, they're they're powerful forces and they are scary so sometimes when i'm in like a deep trance state i'll get really powerful auditory hallucinations of my guides talking to me and it's not my voice it's it can be terrifying the first few times it happened i like jump right out of my meditation like what the fuck was that <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you get used to it right and you start to realize that yeah. these these archetypes of consciousness aka the deities and and it doesn't matter what names you want in my and it kind of matters how you relate to them matters right mm -hmm. like sometimes i like to work with odin thor and loki mm -hmm in in the norse mythology but i i kind of understand that those are and, and please no one out there get mad at me for saying this but they're essentially the same deities as let's say anu enlil and enki from sumerian mythology we've just mm -hmm. different cultures have given these parts of your own mind different yeah. names yeah right and, and there was a somebody was telling me about how kali like the the mythos of kali got over to like um like scandinavia and that's where like odin was kind of sprinkled like she's a part of like odin and loki and i was like that's really fucking fascinating i had no yeah. idea there's like, correlations like, across so travel. many different cultures yeah yeah, yeah. And, and i don't even know i see i i suspect that it's not even that these stories made it to another place mm -hmm. it's that they came up with the same idea at the same time mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. because it's a real concept. These archetypes are real. Unconscious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These these archetypes of the of the the masculine and the feminine and demons and angels they're all very real. They're they're the primal portions of your own mind. And so, you know, if you can imagine living at a time where there was no television or radio, when there wasn't yeah. so much distraction, there was no social media, there was nothing. You would you would spend a lot more time listening to nature and listening to yourself and these archetypes speak directly to you Absolutely. we've kind of lost that yeah and, and through magical practice you can gain access to it and that's yeah. that's gaining access to the magical realm it's a part of you but it's it real is. and and that's why people are really fucking scared of it because a yeah. lot of people are scared of accountability um self-accountability is just that's the one thing that I think people reject the most and the thing that you need to understand and not be afraid to look into your own shit. And I think this is why, you know, the dark ambient sound bath, we've gotten so much pushback with this because I've taken a concept that is very white light and I've applied uh, this method of, um, like this sheath of darkness, but really what's going on is just this self-awareness and self-assessment and self-healing. You cannot be, you can slap a band-aid on, you know, uh, surround yourself in, in pink mist and love and light. And that kind of just slaps a band-aid. You feel great for the evening, but when you go home, you're still dealing with your fucking trauma because you actually didn't get through anything. And so it didn't challenge you. And so um, get a lot of pushback with that. We don't want that kind of energy in our studio. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, you have a yin and yang in your fucking sign up there. Do you not know what that means? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I actually spent uh, a good chunk of today listening to the dark ambient sound bath tracks on YouTube. Oh, and what I was thinking to myself while listening to it was that this is just the perfect soundtrack for shadow work. Yeah, it leads yeah. you down that into that place. Those tones, and mm -hmm. this is a science, a you know, the science of cymatics and binaural mm -hmm. beats and brainwave yeah. frequencies. 
those tones are going to lead you down to that dark place to your subconscious mind where you're going to have these confrontational experiences and it's always some outside force it could be a smell it could mm-hmm. be a sound but your senses can can take you places in your mind if you're in the right, right meditative state and what you've created is the perfect soundtrack for getting in touch with those darker forces of your mind, which, you know, if you want to have control in your life and that's something that, you know, the left-hand path is, is individual self-empowerment, which is mm-hmm. taking control of your own life. Yeah. If you want to have that level of control over yourself, you better get uh, the reins on your demons. Mm-hmm. That's Absolutely. what you need to do. And that's where you need to go. Yeah. And then there's no way around it. You can hide from it your whole life, but you're not going to reach that state of self-empowerment by you know shunning all these parts of you mm-hmm. that you've labeled bad you need right. to confront them and yeah. and you know deal with them and accept them and integrate them and that's exactly why like the the sound bath that we kicked off the project with was exorcism um i wanted people to think of exorcism in a different way and that in that autonomous self-accountability way these demons don't they're not external forces that are fucking with you they're shit that's inside of you that you need to get rid of um and if you don't they will fuck with you on the outside absolutely absolutely and so i really have not gotten any uh negative reviews from that one specifically aside from one who was a gal that again super into the white light um you know surround myself in pink mist and everything will be okay and um and talking to her she's like yeah i experienced some really scary shit and i would never do this again and i'm like i just held the mirror up to your face like <laughs> that scary shit is you girlfriend <laughs> you know yeah. Yeah, yeah actually speaking of which i recently got into black mirror scrying Mm-hmm. And that's just another excellent tool for shadow work because you're, yeah. you're looking at, you have to stare at your own reflection in this black mirror. And I do it with the lights off and two candles on. Mm-hmm. And you just have, you know, just, it, it's, it's the perfect metaphor for me. You know, uh, as Nietzsche said, I believe it was Nietzsche. When you stare deep enough into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. And I don't, yeah. I'm like, I know that I'm getting that quote wrong. And I, but just it's close right enough. Now, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We're fine. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, it's, and it's true. When you stare into that black mirror, you start to see things because you, there's nothing, no light around you, right? right. And, and you start to just like manifest, your subconscious starts to project into the mirror mm-hmm. this story that it has to tell you yeah. or this, this um, urgent message even. Mm-hmm. Um, and your subconscious mind, your right brain is always trying to tell your left brain things, but your left brain is terrible at listening. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to go to that meditative place. Yeah. But it, I mean, it exists to uh, constantly ask questions, right? And Mm -hmm. that's also what I love about that logical side, because when I experience something uh, really profound within that sort of liminal space, I'm always asking myself, like, what, what was it exactly? Could it, could it have been some kind of external uh, force that's in the physical realm that was making me think of something like it really causes me to question myself yeah. and and what I was experiencing to to validate the experience for me um so yeah it just uh it really makes me question like what my experience was when I'm in that liminal space because you know I'm out of my head generally when I'm in that space Um, Or maybe one could say that I'm really deep in my head. Um, But I do, I do believe that I, I'm able to transport myself um, to different dimensions when I can access them. Um, Absolutely. Kind of goes into like the psychonaut. Um, I love utilizing DMT for channeling. Um, I really believe that, that those things can be incredibly uh, powerful to connect with other realms. Um, and in the same vein, I get similar experiences with body suspension and that extreme pain that you need to overcome and get to the other side of, of the fear, right? Um, so that's, I mean, and that's something I experience even going down the rabbit hole, right? I'm just like, ah, everything in me is like, oh God, no, I need to hang on to something. Like I need to keep two feet on the ground. And when I let go, that's when I start to really just 
be in the experience and yeah. and accept everything that um you know the universe has to to offer me it becomes a giant um just a giant like black hole that wants to swallow me and I want to fucking swim around in it and see what's going on, you know? Um, but again, that's, uh, you know, I don't want to advocate anything that anybody, you don't have to do those things to get to that place, but um, it certainly helped me. Yeah, no, I've, and I've gotten there many, there are many doors, mm -hmm. I would say to this place. You can get there through meditation. I've done it. Mm -hmm. um, the last time I did mushrooms, me tell you i had a long talk with shiva yeah yeah and, and you want to know what he said what? <laughs> well, this is all a joke it's all a joke god wants you to laugh it's fucking yeah. funny yeah <laughs> that's it that you was don't the get, core, the joke, like, get the fuck out <laughs> yeah exactly it's and it's not a joke on you it's a really fucking good joke it's hilarious <laughs> That that was the message that I got all night long. And I just, I was sitting here just laughing my ass off on mushrooms, having this conversation with Shiva where he was explaining to me that it's all a joke, man. Yeah. Don't take it so I seriously. It. I love that. Yeah. yeah, there was, there was an experience that I had on DMT where it was one of the only experiences where I had um, a visual of Baphomet himself. Um, and it was just kind of like this stare off contest, but he was smiling, just like, you fucking know what you're doing. You got this. I yeah. don't even need to be here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and it just, it was so warm and validating. And I was like, awesome. I mean, it was warm because he was in blue flame, but <laughs> yeah. for some reason, and I've discovered this recently, um, my first guest that I ever had on the show was Travis McHenry, who's the creator of the Occult Tarot deck, which mm. is a Goetic Tarot deck. It's awesome. It's beautiful, but it fucks with me, man. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, my subconscious does not respond well to um, so, like Abrahamic iconography. Mm -hmm. It mm. responds wonderfully to Norse iconography mm -hmm. uh, or to Hindu iconography. Yeah. But when I start flipping through the Goetia or working with the occult tarot deck, weird things start happening in my house. Mm. For whatever reason, that particular set of, um, of entities just really likes to mess with me. <laughs> but when I when I do my work with the with the Hindu deities or with the Egyptian deities, which are the deities that I kind of grew up with. Mm -hmm. I, I was obsessed with ancient Egypt from as, from as long as I can remember, and I had no idea why. And it wasn't until I was 35 years old that I found out about that on my birthday, which is August mm -hmm. the 8th, mm -hmm. every year, the star Sirius aligns with the Great Pyramid. Mm. Wow. That's crazy. I, synchronicity is amazing. Yeah. But it just yeah. it, it helps you understand yourself, right? And so now I kind of get that subconsciously I always have this obsession with ancient Egypt and the, the Egyptian deities just make sense to me. Even when I, I use Western astrology, but mm -hmm. I refer to the planets by their Egyptian deity names, because that's, that's just the mythology that speaks to me the most, yeah. but I like to, I love to dabble in other mythologies. Yeah. And when I feel like I've got a grip on one. I move on to another. Yeah. And I love finding the correspondences between them and understanding that, that all of these deities and gods are like one big happy family. <laughs> And that's what I really love about chaos magic is you really, um, you go into it as like a student and you're just researching everything, anything that you can get your hands on to gather some type of knowledge. Um, and when you come at something with a lot of respect and you incorporate that into your practice, like you can, I, I don't feel that cherry picking in that way is disrespectful at all. If you're incorporating something that resonates with you why would you not use it so yeah. that, that aspect of uh chaos magic really resonated with me yeah. as well as the sigil work i started recently working with runes after mm -hmm. doing my podcast episode with juan fabregat who's a rune teacher and mm -hmm. i've just completely fallen in love with runes yeah. they are incredible yeah. they are such projectile force mm -hmm. when it comes to casting spells mm -hmm. and they're so easy to you can paint them on absolutely anything yeah, you know, I painted yeah. over my son's doorway uh, a runic protection spell and explained yeah. it to him, so he knows that you know this is gonna stop. And it's and that's the great thing about runes is they are they're forceful, right? It's yeah. not just like a protection spell; it's a it's a fuck you up if you come near me spell. Yeah, yeah. 
you know? well even even in the style uh that they are drawn in is very um reminds me of sort of like um like a wall like a cage like like, like yeah the shield wall. Like away from me a shield yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so I love that about reading magic. And for me, when it comes to chaos magic, and this is what I'm all about, if it works, I use it. If mm -hmm. it doesn't work, I ditch it. Same. That's it. That's, that's how I operate. And I study, I mean, as much as I can get my hands on from any culture, from any practice, I want to know it all. I want to see how it all relates to each other. I want to find the underlying sort of truth because there is one. It seems to me that all of the different magical practices and religions and, uh, and esoteric philosophies are all different languages that act as psychic framework for you to interact with the one underlying metaphysical reality that is the foundation for all of these different Absolutely. practices. And, yeah. and any way that you access that that's personal to you, that feels right to you, then that's the way you should do it. That's because yeah. that's the way it's going to work the best. So for example, I, I have a good friend who works with the Goetic Demons and she loves it and that's what resonates with her and so it works and so she's she we can manifest powerfully through that for me mm -hmm. it's it's other things it's the runes and, and sigil work and um and my meditation practices yeah 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 I mean, it's bloodletting <laughs> yeah okay so that that brings me to now now i, I want to get into these your projects because they're so cool so uh, tell me about coven of ashes uh, so Coven of Ashes started as a singular project. Uh, I was working as the director, um, the chapter director for a suspension theatrical, a theatrical suspension troupe called Constructs of Ritual Evolution or CORE. Um, so I was acting as a director for that a specific show in LA that had to do with women in extreme performance art. Um, and in talking with the promoter um, a few weeks before we were about to perform this thing, I asked him like, who's, who's opening for us? And he was like, well, couldn't find anybody last minute. So I guess I'm just going to do something. And I was like, this is all about women and extreme performance art. <laughs> so uh, I was like, I got you. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. I'll put something together. So I put something together um, with women that I knew um, were not given uh, opportunities within like the suspension realm to really do performances. They may not have been asked to perform or um, even women that I knew from like the, the tribal fusion belly dance community that were we were very off the cuff for the tribal belly dance community. They didn't like what we were doing. Um, and we were sort of like swept under the rug. So I pulled those women out. I'm like, let's do something really crazy. Um, and so really just crazy. to clarify, sorry, sure. just to clarify for the people listening at home, when you say suspension, we're talking about hook suspension. Flesh hook suspension, yes. Okay. So yeah, I just last minute threw a bunch of these women together that uh, I came up with a concept which was heavily influenced by uh, the original intent of Buto, which is a Japanese modern dance form. And uh, the concept, the original concept behind that was um, to act as if or to embody um, the souls of Hiroshima re-inhabiting their physical body. So I really liked that and I wanted to um, honor that, but but make it applicable for um, what we were experiencing as an, as an all-female uh, group of witches. And uh, so we decided in that, e um, prior to that evening, that we would take that concept and apply it to re-inhabiting the bodies of women who were persecuted for witchcraft, whether or not they were a witch, uh, just that they were persecuted as one. Um, and some of the, the women incorporated actually traced their lineages back to people who were um, either hung or drowned or not a lot of them were actually burned, but um, there was still definitely some, some really intense ways of, of uh, murdering those people. So 
uh, we, we kind of took it backwards, right? Like we started as ash on the ground. We rose through flame and we were just screaming our fucking asses off. Um, people were crying. It was really intense. Even, even in the, the rehearsal, people were crying or having to leave um, because, you know, I, I told them with Buto, you're not acting. This is, you are literally being burned. I want you to have that in your head, have that in your body. We are really being burned alive right now. And so what came out of those women was one of the most visceral experiences that I've ever had. And it had nothing to do with bloodletting at all. Um, so we had that show uh, and then I proceeded to um, like perform and direct the show right after that. I, I don't know why I thought I could do that all, but uh, I'm pretty ambitious. <laughs> so um, it was a wonderful night. It was a great show. It was never meant to be anything um, with any kind of longevity. It was just supposed to be that opening, um, that opening night. And then we got contacted by the Satanic Temple who I guess there were members that were at that performance and um, they really wanted us to do something all female like that, but um, with hooks. And I was like, well, we have the experience. Um, so we, we put some more women together and this, this became like a kind of a, a larger than life. Uh, it was more than just the women that were a part of it. We represented um, or were aiming to represent the autonomy of, of all women or all uh, female identifying people and um, had a really wonderful ritual for that. It ended up, a uh, piece of it ended up in um, Hail Satan, which is about TST. And um, yeah, it just, I mean, from there it grew. We, we kept getting asked to, to bring it somewhere else. We were asked to return for the women's mass for um, the satanic temple. And um, I, I really feel that they brought us on um, because they wanted the, they wanted real ritual going on. Um, they're a very political uh, group, which I respect. Um, but there's a lot of internal politics that get very messy and there's a lot of drama that I don't want to be a part of. So I stayed the fuck away from that. But uh, I understood why they were calling on us. Um, they definitely wanted to have that aspect of um, very serious ritual space. Mm -hmm. And I think we commanded that kind of attention. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, then it just became a thing and we kept doing it and it got bigger and bigger, not in terms of the membership, but in terms of like standing back and being like this, this is more than just the people in it. This represents something uh, larger than, larger than us. So we all felt compelled to continue doing it. Um, and then having the experience in other flesh hook suspension, um, troops and communities, um, we were able to pull that knowledge from there and apply that with uh, the bloodletting. And then it kind of, then it really became about the bloodletting because it was like every single woman at a certain point was in some way tied to the flesh hook suspension community. So they, they already have that reverence for the pain and the blood and what that, where that takes them and what that does for them. So, um, you know, we utilize that a lot. Um, we didn't utilize suspension a lot. If we did, we brought in practitioners that, uh, had more experience than, than we did, but, um, did a lot of flesh pulls, a lot of um, cheek spears and things like that that uh, come from traditions all over the world. So uh, yeah, that's that's Coven of Ashes. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the bloodletting and and blood magic and how that plays into your practice and your uh, businesses and such. Yeah. Um, I it's like where where to begin, <laughs> right? Um, 
like I said, with Coven of Ashes, we were already a part of the suspension community. I had found flush hook suspension through like this very underground, um, I don't want to call it a club. It was a, it was definitely a venue, um, really amazing artistic stuff going on. And um, for people that know me know that I, I owe so much to this event called Orbis Next that was happening in Oakland. Um, so much so that I got its logo tattooed on me because <laughs> I, I would not be making what I create now had it not been for the experiences that I had at that underground event. But I found out about CORE through that event and I really liked that they were taking that, taking something that could be uh, considered so brutal and making it really beautiful. One of the first images I saw was of a woman on hooks um, and the hooks sort of splayed out into these angel wings and she was wearing like a 20 foot dress and contorting her body. And I was like, this is amazing. Like you're not only incorporating sort of like circus acts, but you have ritual going on and you have theatrical, like it was, it blew my mind and I had to be a part of it. So, uh, I signed up right away <laughs> and, um, we, I, I was belly dancing at the time, so I entered as a makeup artist and a belly dancer and just started learning, just started soaking up all of this information and seeing people really um, have these amazing transformative experiences through um, this flesh hook suspension. Now, backtracking a little bit, in my youth, I, I was definitely a cutter. Um, it wasn't always something that I was doing because I hated myself. There were definitely times where the depression kicked in, but I, I think what I was starting to put together in my head was that I could have a different kind of relationship with pain. And um, it didn't necessarily have to be something that was so uh, somber. It could be really uplifting. And that those are the feelings that I was getting when I was, um, you know, self-harming. I was feeling a lot of uh, connection to my body. I was feeling that autonomy. I was feeling euphoria. Like there was so much going on other than just, I fucking hate myself because it wasn't that all the time. Sometimes it's like, I just need to, that reminder that I'm physically present and I'm here on the physical plane. Um, so I started to kind of wrap my head around, um, wanting to suspend and I had done like little play piercing stuff before, uh, one of my first pull flesh pull experiences was with, um, the dear Fakir Musafar and, um, we did just like little, uh, little chest, um, hypodermic needles with some twine on the end of it and we just you know pulled either against a person or we pulled against like a pole and he would come up and he had like he had a vibrator and just would put it on our lines just just to just to give us like a different experience to see how we either liked or didn't like different sensations within that and you're already like well, I'm the sensation is that I'm pulling on these uh, piercings and that's a whole new, you know, uh, experience for a lot of people. And that's, I think, one of the things that freaks people out the most. Um, but taking that to a place with like hooks and putting your entire body weight, trusting your entire body weight with that my mind was just like, I don't know, I don't think I'll ever be able to do something like that. And um, being a woman of size, I didn't even think that it was possible for me to do something like that. Um, and then I talked to some of the piercers in core and they were like, absolutely, you can do it. Like it might take an extra hook or two, but yeah, we'll get you off the fucking ground. So I scheduled my first uh, suspension and I had an amazing experience and, and you'll never get that first one back. Like it'll, it, it will never be like the first time, but um, 
I, my, my mom wanted to be there. Um, I'm Navajo, which is not a bloodletting tribe, but when I told her that I wanted to do this, um, I related it back to the Mandan tribe and the Lakota and what they were doing um, as a, it was a primarily male practice to go from boy to man or to acquire some kind of um, skill set. And the women were really just there to support. So I was like, number one, this is like fucking feminist as fuck for me to do this to my body. And then number two, this is my pull towards, you know, our our Navajo culture. So um, it's a little removed, but it's still there. And when I put it in those terms, she fully understood and was fully on board with it. And she was, she just told me, she's like, film everything. I want to see everything. She couldn't actually be there for it, but she wanted to see the entire process. And there's footage of, you know, me going up and just kind of hanging there for a while. And it looks like my mouth is moving. I don't remember saying anything, but she, she pointed out, she's like, I think you're chanting something. And I, I have no idea what that was. I don't doubt it at all. There was all kinds of shit. My, my mind was spinning to the point where I do remember telling the main practitioner, stop the spinning. And he's like, you're not spinning at all. (laughs) So, um, yeah, um, amazing experience. And from there I got the taste for blood and it was just like, what else can I fucking do? How can I kind of chase this, um, this, this transformative experience? How can I do that again? What, how deep does this rabbit hole go? You know, there was a whole other world that opened up to me, um, even within just the community of people, um, but yeah, then it, I mean, then it kind of opened up to scarification and, and the different types that you can do and um, extreme body modification and stuff like that. And I just kind of went down that path and I love challenging myself. Part of that is challenging my body. And in doing so, I'm challenging my mind because it's completely a mind over matter situation. Your body can absolutely handle that your flesh can handle that it's just your mind that you have to overcome Mm -hmm. yeah that's always true that's yeah that's sort of the the underlying truth of all things is mind over matter absolutely Absolutely. Um, now that is to say of course we do live in a physical world with physical Mm -hmm. laws Uh, i don't i'm not an advocate of the kind of new age uh you know we're in the matrix and you can you know i if you if you you're not going to levitate let me put it that way without the yeah. hooks <laughs> and, and i think that i just personally feel like you know it's not to knock um anyone's spiritual practice but i do advocate to my clients and, and to my students don't don't get focused on on developing superpowers that's mm-hmm. not what this is about Right. That's not what magic is about to me and the mm-hmm. way that I teach it. Uh, it's about trans- self-transformation. Mm-hmm. And through self-transformation, you trans- transform your, your outer circumstances. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have people messaging me all the time saying, can you teach me to manifest fire? And I'm like, buddy, do you think that if I could manifest fire, I'd be on you know Instagram and, 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 and trying to push my own business doing tarot readings? Like, no, I'd be out there finding the other X-Men and, and you know, putting our team together <laughs> yeah um, anyways yeah just I, I go on that rant anytime the subject comes up because it's important to me right I, I i don't like um seeing people spiritually bypassing w- and trying to, to develop all these superpowers and, and thinking yeah. that magic is some shortcut mm-hmm. it is a shortcut in a way It is sort of a cheat code to life to understand how it works and understand that magic is the underlying nature of reality. Um, But it's not, it's, it's not the cheap sort of, I'm going to move objects with my mind kind of crap that that people get really attracted to and and lures them into cults. You know, Mm -hmm. there's, uh, I'm just going on a tangent now, but you know, like the cult of Nithyananda, for example, Mm -hmm. has all these people believing that, that they're, uh, you know eating a banana and spitting out pearls and they're getting conned 
you know, wow. and they're, they're getting conned and, and giving away uh, tremendous amounts of money um, with this, like, I'll teach you how to open your third eye mysticism. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are real things, but they, but they aren't cheap tricks. Yeah. 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 I, I was really um, kind of tickled. I, I find cults really fascinating because it's really just somebody who's learned how to manipulate a bunch of people. Um, well, yeah, it's a dark magician. It's a yeah. successful black magician who's yeah. conning you because yeah. that's what black and, magicians, you know, what I refer to as black magic. Now, okay, mm -hmm. let me make this distinction here because I know plenty of people who practice what they would call black magic who are not mm -hmm. con artists, who are wonderful people. Yeah. Um, but when I say black magic, I mean somebody who's out to get you. This, mm -hmm. this is a con artist. That's what right. I mean, right? Yeah. They, they might have the psychological skills to con you. That's mm -hmm. magic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, magic and a talent. But yeah, I was I mean, I was tickled pink when I found out that like Heaven's Gate actually still exists. Like mm -hmm. I thought the last remaining one was like Scientology. And I was like, Oh, my God, oh my God. Nexium, Ananda, Scientology, Freaking crazy. Um, you know, and I, there are other other people I won't name names here but there there are other spiritual teachers out there who have large followings so I'd say yeah. like this person is at very least an aspiring cult leader right right you know? and, and you a see lot it all the time people, yeah I feel like a lot of those people come off as um you know they're they have some sort of ability to to heal people to give people some kind of hope in um especially in surrounding yourself in love and light you know, mm -hmm. they, they come at it from that point of view because that's what's going to pull people in. It's not scary. It's really palatable for uh, the masses, you know. Um, yeah, and, and if you're just discovering it. spirituality, if, if you're brand new to this and you're having your, your first ever awakening experience, and those things can be super attractive and oh, maybe totally. you're coming out of a dark place, but eventually you start to realize, wait a minute, I'm just, you know, this is, this doesn't all add up anymore. Yeah. Something's yeah. off here. Yeah. Um, and, and something that I, I notice in, in some of the new age spirituality toward the communities is that they're, they're really kind of replicating Christianity mm -hmm. in, in this new sort of new age way with crystals and this and that, but there's still the, the duality and the mm -hmm. schism of these people are good and these people are bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and not, not the integration of light and dark. It's, mm -hmm. it's the, or, or this idea, you know, here's something that, annoys me to no end um and, and is part of how i see the left-hand path uh this idea of service to others is good and service to self is bad mm -hmm. okay but wait a minute but wait <laughs> the a minute. collective aren't is there, made out of individuals aren't there a bunch of memes about self-care <laughs> like... yeah good point <laughs> and, but also if you know the, the greatest thing and i firmly believe this the greatest thing you could ever offer to the world is your authentic self mm -hmm. Absolutely. It doesn't do you any good to run around preaching about love and light and telling other people how to behave. I really like the idea of, of improving yourself to offer the best version of yourself to the world. And, mm -hmm. and when you do that, when you really work on yourself and you, you put the focus in to doing the best you can, you become a force in the world. You're no longer a person that life happens to. You mm -hmm. take control of your own life and you take control of your own aura and in so doing, everybody around you is going to be like, yo, what's, you know, what are you doing differently? Mm -hmm. And then they're going to start to imitate. Because if you improve yourself, if you start doing better uh, in life and, and taking more responsibility and, and really getting your shit together, it has an effect on other people. people it has an effect on the world. Yeah, yeah. So service to self is service to others. Now that's in one way, you know, if, if what you mean by service to self is just being a dick, then sure. But that's, that's not what I hear when I hear service to self, right? Like right. I'm about to go back to school. I'm 37 years old. I'm about to uh, embark on a second career, mm -hmm. you know, that to me, this is service to self. I need to get a better job so I can take better mm -hmm. care of my son. Yeah. You know? But it's still like, I need to work on me. Yeah. That that's my pride. That's, that's what I'm responsible for as my portion of humanity is me. And I need to make sure that it's the best it can be because then I'm doing my part. And that's self-accountability. Yeah. That's, that's the real big, scary one for people. And that's what I think people do not understand about the, about the left-hand path is that it is the path of self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, to that with, within the suspension stuff, once I experienced that, 
I did get to a place where I was like, I can fucking do anything. If I can do that, if I can do this thing that people look at and they're just like, oh, I could never do that. If I can do that thing and I love doing that thing, I can fucking do anything. <laughs> like um, To the point where this is a wonderful story when I, I was still working in the cannabis industry, um, one of my bosses was reprimanding me for something and I had just gotten back from a suspension camp out. And I had done one of the most brutal suspensions that I have ever experienced in my life. And that was a chest suspension. And for, uh, for the Mandan tribe in the Lakota chest suspension is, is primarily what they do. They'll either do the chest or they'll do the back. Um, and it's really fucking gnarly. Um, even more so gnarly for women because our chest um, our, our breast area, the skin is a, a little more frail than would be on a male. Um, so <laughs> that was a horrifying experience where I was like, I'll never do that again. And then it took me 72 hours and I was like, I will absolutely do that again <laughs> um, <laughs> because it challenged the shit out of me. It was, I cried all day in anticipation of this fucking ritual and, um, And it was amazing. But when I came back to work from that weekend, my manager, my boss was just complaining to me about some stupid, it was either like a mistake I made or something that I needed to push on like a a retail or sales point of view. And I just like, he was being really condescending and I just like sat back and I literally laughed. And in my head, I'm just like, you have no idea what I'm capable of motherfucker. Like, like I have seen worlds that you will never see. And, um, your perception of reality is so fucking small and I kind of pity you. (laughs) Like, and then that realization, I was like, I can't work like this anymore. I can't work for other people who have this in their mind as the most important thing to them. Um, you know, everybody's got their own thing. That's fine. That's what was important to him. But I feel like I saw so much more in challenging myself in, um, doing that pretty horrific self-care, but it took me to a place that I needed to be. Um, once you experience that and that no matter how, and there's, you know, there's so many different roads Mm -hmm. to experience that state of mind, the, the magical state of mind, the, the other the other realms, the other dimensions of consciousness. Um, once you've experienced that, this becomes very boring to you. Yeah. This yeah. becomes like, I mean, it's not to say that the material world isn't important. Obviously it's where we exist, mm-hmm. but you just see it differently. All of a sudden yeah. you just don't have these same fears and anxieties about it because you know that there's so much more than mm-hmm. this. This is just the yeah. baseline sort of, uh, if reality were a computer, this is the, just the desktop, mm-hmm. right? The, yeah. the underlying system is the metaphysical reality. And when you approach it through altering your state of consciousness, mm-hmm. uh, either through meditation or magic ritual or DMT or mushrooms or psychedelics or through, through pain, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all of these are tools that have been used for, in spirituality since the beginning of time. Yeah. To access that other realm of consciousness. And once you access it, changes you forever and there's no going back yeah yeah and there's a lot of people who will ask me like well what does that feel like and the closest thing I can give to somebody that has never done it is like do you do meditation yes okay have you meditated for very long to where you get to that point where you're neither here nor there and they're like yeah, but it's taken like maybe once, but it's taken me hours of meditate. And I was like, suspension does that in a second. And it's, it, it just rips you out of reality. <laughs> it's like, and it kind of shows you the real reality. Um, it's uh, bringing it back to the matrix. Like it's, you know, it's the red pill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, understanding metaphysics and, and the underlying reality. And, and you can understand it through quantum physics also. You can understand it through math mm-hmm. there, you know, or through secular science if you have an open mind to, it, it, you know, the bare minimum 
entry to understanding this stuff is to understand that reality is essentially non-physical, mm-hmm. that it's a creation of consciousness. As soon as you get your mind wrapped around that, uh, which would be the hermetic principle of mentalism, the mm-hmm. all is mind, the universe is mental, you know, it, because every, like I said, everything you experience, and this is just a fact, everything that you experience, all the sounds, the smells, the touches, the tastes, it's all constructed in your brain. Once you get a grip on that and you understand that it's all an illusion mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and every spirit sense of spirituality is sort of uh, <laughs> trying to explain this to you, like the, the Buddhist um, uh, description of emptiness, mm-hmm. you know, this, this is illusory. This is an illusion, or you can understand it, um, you know, the way Bruce Lipton, for example, starts to talk about the quantum field, you know, you could, you could understand it that way, but it's just, just knowing that there is an underlying reality that you don't have access to in your everyday waking state of life, but you do have access to it through these altered states of consciousness. As soon as you get there, there's just no going back. It's yeah. It's really hard, really hard to exist uh, within the normal, you know, physical plane of existence after experiencing shit like that, it just, um, your whole value system for what's on the physical plane, for me, it went right out the door. Um, I'm also an Aquarius, it's an air sign, and I don't want to be in the physical realm most of the time. Um, no, Aquarius I would much is the, rather is the be, space case. <laughs> yeah, I would much <laughs> rather be somewhere else. And uh, it just, I mean, it kicked that into high gear. And how how else can I get to that place um, once, once I experienced that? I think before that, really, the only experiences I had, um, you know, were like astral projection or meditation and and again it would take so long and not that this is a shortcut not that suspension is a shortcut it's definitely an extreme uh form of getting to that place but because of my history with um already challenging myself physically as a teenager um i think i was more open to that possibility of of getting something real from it um, getting to the meat and potatoes, which on that note, I have this really kind of fucked up idea. I mean, I feel like it's a good idea, but I feel the general public would think it was fucked up, but I really feel like people, uh, people who work with children, especially children who are troubled, children who are self-harming, um, I think if we educated them on all these other cultures who incorporate some sort of like pain ritual within their adolescence, they would understand a lot more about what's going on inside of them. Like as American kids, we don't have that ritual of I am becoming an adult you don't have any rituals no we've no. lost all of them you have to yeah. create your own and that was one of the the driving ideas for me in uh in my adult life and um was that search for ritual mm-hmm. which is funny because i i sort of am the laziest ritual magician that there ever has <laughs> been um but that's just you know i i, I I love reading Crowley, but I will never do one of his rituals like to it. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I, I, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I have a very eclectic sense of magic and my magic works shockingly well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still blown away by it every time. And I've been doing this since I was 15. Mm-hmm. Um, still, I still get spooked. I still get creeped out. I'm still just like, I can't believe I did this. <laughs> <laughs> did you fucker see this shit <laughs> yeah but, but you get more and more accustomed to it you you grow accustomed to you know as a kid i had night terrors because mm-hmm. i would be visited by entities mm-hmm. now i i am visited by an entity and i'm like ah oh, well what are you what, you, what are you, you want yeah. i know that you're a projection of my subconscious i know that you're yeah. here to tell me something so what's up <laughs> yeah. yeah you know um because you get used to it but it but it's terrifying in the beginning yeah Uh, It is. And I think like when I was, um, when I was an adolescent, um, I, I was, I don't know, probably just getting out of like high school and I stumbled upon 
um, Sorceress Cagliastro, which some people might recognize her name, and she is a blood sorceress. And she had a podcast back in the day um, that like a light just went off for me because she, this specific podcast was talking about um, what's on the other side of fear when you're having uh, these experiences with either the disincarnate or you're having experiences where, you know, different parts of you are coming to you um, or interdimensional entities interacting with you. Um, yeah, you're going to be scared. It's going to be scary. Got it. What's next? You know? And <laughs> yeah. And it's just having the understanding really helps with the fear. Mm -hmm. Um the way that I like to explain it to people is that because it seems that these things are out there, mm -hmm. right? But you need to understand that there is no out there, out mm -hmm. there. It's in yeah. here. The doorway to out there is in here. <laughs> and, exactly. you know, that's, you, you get that. It just, it calms you to the, yeah. the things that are happening around you, to the synchronicities and the you know, I experience a lot of paranormal activity just in my, and I have my entire life. And like I said, you just get used to it. Yeah. But when, when it's around you all the time, you know, it's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I hate, I don't want to sound crazy when I say these things, but you know, you do just get used to it and it becomes part of your everyday. You just, yeah. you, you realize what's going on and, and it, it's not as scary when you understand yeah. it. You can become accustomed yeah. to it. And that's the great thing about magical practice is that it gets you used to these things, mm -hmm. which are kind of happening all the time anyway. Your brain yeah. just spends a lot of time filtering it out if you're not open to it. If you're not paying attention, if you're not, yeah, if you're not open to it. And that was the thing of, of my adolescence was I was experiencing shit and I was so afraid of what I was experiencing because nobody wanted to talk about what it meant, what it could possibly be, um, or really want anything to do with that. It was just like, ooh, a scary story, and then you move on. But I really wanted to understand what's on the other side of that fear. Like, boo, ah, yeah, but next, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. can we get to the next part? So she started explaining that in this podcast, and I started following her pretty religiously. Um, started purchasing her books on blood magic and i was just like this is what i've been looking for you know this this kind of connection with my body with uh the iron in my body and even just um connecting with that that uh physical autonomy is just it was a beautiful experience and she put it so eloquently and um highly highly recommend her books I, I go over that in my Blood Magic 101 course. It was really important to me to focus on the cultures that are still practicing this stuff today. Um, it's been practiced for eons by every single fucking culture um, that every single, you know, culture that recognized blood as um, currency and blood as vitality. Um, I don't think there's a single culture that didn't do something blood related, whether it was uh, sacrificing somebody or causing themselves pain in order to get to that higher level or reach God or whatever it was, pay for their sins. Like we really delve deep into that in uh, Blood Magic 101 because I want people to understand where this comes from. When I saw for the first time I saw um, something on like National Geographic about the, the festival of Tai Pusam. And it's this giant festival of um, people praying to Lord Murugan and Kali. And they are like pierced from head to toe. This is where a lot of the cheek spears are being done. And when I learned what it was that they were doing they were um, basically ha like like putting these burdens on themselves to show uh, their deities and their ancestors that they will bear their ancestral burdens with glee because they're doing these extremely painful things and they're dancing and they go through this entire procession up this mountain like it's it's 
they're really fucking their body up but the thing of it is is that they're left with no scarring so it's like that's the mystery right that's the blessing that they went through this thing and and the blessing is uh more powerful if you're especially if you're doing fucking machetes in your face and you walk away with no scarring like that's you gotta wonder what that's about (laughs) yeah I think it's amazing and and when I saw footage like that I just started crying I was like this is one of the most profound um dedications of self to your belief system and your ancestry your family your um whatever god it is that you believe in um you're challenging yourself. Your blood is currency and you're trying to do what you can to give the most of yourself. Um, It's in my belief uh, with the blood magic that I practice is that blood is like the ultimate gift of myself. That's the most thing aside from giving my life and offing myself. (laughs) Um, It's a physical manifestation of of life force energy. Yeah. It's that vitality. And, and I can give that like two times over as a woman. um, And that's where I kind of like utilize venal blood as more uh, like a lively magic things that need to move. And then menstrual blood is dead blood to me. So if I'm doing something, a working of like banishment or stopping or putting uh, some some sort of, sorry about that horn, <laughs> or putting some sort of uh, death to um, maybe some, some uh, addiction or toxic presence or something like that, I would use menstrual blood. Um, and that's not everybody's bag. Maybe, maybe they use menstrual blood as uh, something more about abundance and the fruit of your labor or your child. But for me, I'm like, that shit is shed. Like, there's no baby in there. That shit is dead, right? Like, it's dead blood. So that's where my kind of thought process comes from in there. No, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And, and I think that's what what's important with your own magical practice is that it makes sense to you that this yeah. is what feels yeah. correct to you yeah um, and that's i love saying that in my classes because it's like i can offer you suggestions but i am not the end all be all on what this kind of magic is and ultimately you are your own autonomous being and you can figure it out for yourself <laughs> yeah and i would actually argue and again you know uh some people might despise me for saying this but whatever in, it's my opinion that all magic is chaos magic because mm-hmm. no matter how far back you go, it came from somebody's personal gnosis. Somebody yeah. figured this out and figured it out for themselves and wrote mm-hmm. it down, but that does not necessarily translate to the next person. Mm-hmm. The next person might understand the principles, but just have a different way of their own interaction with that metaphysical realm that's just slightly different. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and if it's and if it feels right to them to do it in a slightly different way, then that's what's going to work better for that person. Right, and and Absolutely. that's true for all eight billion of us. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's got their own we, personal. We all gotta we gotta figure it out some way, and I feel like whatever way it is that you need to get there, if you're not exploiting people, if you come into it with a reverence and respect from whatever wherever you learned it from, then you're not doing any harm to anybody. You are utilizing something that works for you. So tell me about Sui Generis Magica. Okay. So this was born out of um, uh, this. There's so much. It was born out of so much. Uh, the 12 years that I put into the suspension community and all that I learned there Um, the amazing people that I met, the magical practices that they would share with me, um, my own reading and research and reverence for the magic I was already doing. Um, People have a tendency to come to me specifically for um, like blood magic rituals. And I, I, I don't know where that sort of came from other than, you know, uh, people know me from Coven of Ashes. And so they want to experience what the people, what the women 
uh, are experiencing on stage, they they have some sort of interest with that. Um, and or I've met them through the suspension community, and they're they're not ritualistic at all. They're doing it to challenge themselves physically, but they want to incorporate more of the spiritual side of it. So I'll get kind of those that that mixture of people um, that come to me with questions about blood magic, and I was approached by um, like a collective who asked me to write the blood magic 101 and 102 and a light just went off in my head and I was like people will pay for my knowledge (laughs) like I had never thought about that before and they were like well absolutely they they paid me for writing these classes and I realized that like I have I had already written classes on like sigil magic Um, for constructs of ritual evolution and coven of ashes. Um, I was already hosting, um, you know, lessons like that. Um, I also started incorporating uh, the Japanese movement of Bhutto um, because that type of movement for me is very meditative and very expressive of the id. Um, So I really wanted to kind of have a place for all of that to exist. Um, I am certainly a maker of things. I have uh, provisions, oils, and altarpieces that uh, are available on there because people will see things that I create or I've hosted an oil making um, night with some of the girls and I'm just like, yeah, uh, people actually uh, want this knowledge. And it's more than just, um, you know, a a passing by like interest, they really want to dig into this. And I'm interested in meeting people like that. And and I'm also expending a lot of energy uh, creating those things. Um, I would find myself creating rituals for you know, friends or friends of friends and putting absolutely hours of work into a ritual based on their need and then find out later that those hours that I put into creating that ritual, they weren't using. And I was like, I need to stop putting energy into people that are not willing to um, take the fucking bull by the horns and get it done. You know, if you just have a wavering like, oh, yeah, I want to make a hex because fuck this person. And then two days later, you're over it. I don't want to have to put my energy into helping you with that. And then it goes nowhere like that fucks with me and my energy. So I need to be really weary of, um, you know, people's uh, legitimate interest in in working with me in that way. And so, you know, I started charging for consultations and um, started putting like my oils and stuff on for sale and creating things that I felt really represented the left hand path in that they are like the altar pieces, for example, they're like, it's like artwork, like sigillic artwork that isn't really um you know like a hand painted sigil but it's still representative of something and it's meant to be put in a place where you either pass by it every day or i don't know maybe you burn it you can do whatever the fuck you want with it after it leaves my hands but there is a specific intent and purpose that i put into each of those pieces and it all has to do with (laughs) self-accountability um and then the oils that i've created Um, are really to get people into that liminal space to really help them Um, it's it's huge to me um, to activate all of my senses so it's like the music um, the the scent of you know the incense the oils like adorning myself like really getting into that headspace uh, in order to manifest whatever the fuck it is I'm trying to manifest and um you know, I just, I, I thought about um, these classes that I was creating and I was like, I have a lot to offer. And I think that 
if people are willing to, to pay money to take these classes and I'm expending all of this energy to make this great, beautiful thing, I can make it accessible to more people. And um, yeah, I, I just, I went with that. I, um, I'm somebody that's kind of a, <laughs> I'm a doer. And if I have an idea for something, like it's, it takes me a couple weeks, but uh, it's put together. Um, like the website was put together in probably a week or two and just already flushed out. I already had the implements uh, ready to go. Um, it was something that I just, I move with a passion. So there's no way that it can uh, fail. I feel like if you have passion and fire behind something like that and getting knowledge out to people, there's no way that that can fail. No, and the left-hand path certainly has a way of igniting the fire and the passion in you. Yeah. And that's what I love about it is it really gets you in that place of what can I create yeah. in my own heart and my own hands. Yeah. And I, you know, I got to a place um, creatively where I was feeling really stagnant. And I think that was because I was expending all of this energy, especially with like performances. Um, sadly, with a lot of the performances uh, I was doing with, even with Coven of Ashes, because of the safety aspect I wasn't able to really tap into my own liminal ritual headspace because I'm like, we're at a venue. What if somebody trips and falls? They have a fucking cheek spear in their face. <laughs> like I'm having to be mom and watch all the things. So it takes me out of that headspace. I really hope, you know, I, I go into it with the hope that the women that are also experiencing this, that, that they get something out of it. But I kind of have to pull myself back to assess and make sure that everybody's okay. And um, that's just me being a responsible human being. Um, I care about these women, obviously. So I definitely recognized I was, I was kind of going through like a burnout on um, performing and I started to kind of like pull back and just experience not only my own rituals but have other people facilitate rituals for me and i was just like sponging that energy and i was like wow i did not realize how dry i was from just putting out you know constant flow of energy um i wasn't in a space where i was receiving i was being sucked dry and um from a multitude of places so i really had to just pull back and assess where I was and make sure to feed myself and feed my energy. And, um, and, that, and in that way, I was also able to grow. Um, I think I was really missing that opportunity because um, I was kind of trying to catch people up to where uh, I was at, all of the knowledge that I had acquired and sought out myself. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to bring people into that. So um, it was really hard for me to learn more and ex expand my knowledge and, and put energy back into the things that really interested me. And so kind of pulling back from the performance aspect, uh, I was able to really like dedicate more time to myself, more time to my practice and put energy into these things that I'm creating with my hands. And um, that just felt really good. I was able to step back and even get more into my Bhutto practice, which it's, it's a moving meditation for me. Um, and I just, yeah, I love doing it. I needed to feed myself uh, I will still continue performing, but I definitely reached a burnout point for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, cause you need that spiritual sustenance as yeah. well. You need, you need to, to take energies in if you're just expending then Yeah. Like you said, yeah. you're going to get burnt out really quickly. Yeah. I wasn't doing anybody any favors by being that burnt out. <laughs> so, no. um, yeah, I just, I just took it upon myself as like, I have this idea. It is kind of uh, focused on 
what I'm doing and not focused on any sort of group capacity. So I was able to just focus and hone in on exactly what I wanted to do. And then the rest is, as they say, history. <laughs> yeah, well, it's very it's really recent cool. history. <laughs> and very cool yeah. history. I mean, um, yeah. you know, I spent a good deal of time preparing for this interview on your websites and they're mm -hmm. gorgeous. Thank you. And your products look super cool. Um, the dark ambient sound bath is amazing. It, it's all it's all awesome, and it's and it's got it's such a cool package. It works together. Yeah. Uh, I'm three working. Projects work so well. I'm working right now and actually condensing all three websites into one. Um, I I was approached by my my the musician that I work with for dark ambient sound bath. He was like yeah, you should probably just have one place for all of your projects. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? That's not a bad idea. Just have them all on one site instead of pointing them in different directions because somebody who really likes the sound bath may have no idea about Coven of Ashes or no idea about Sui Generis Magica. So um, yeah, I thought that that was, I'm still in the process of moving those things around, but um when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, the, the dark ambient sound bath is a service that I offer. We're absolutely willing to do, um, you know, private sound baths for people who, you know, really want to challenge themselves. I wanted to tell you about this too. When, so I was going through a really hard time within my mental health journey and, um, I was going to therapy, I was going to like group therapy, personal therapy, seeing a psychiatrist and doing everything that I could to take responsibility for my emotions. And um, I came upon, you know, sound baths in general and started doing some research into um, where the, the nearest one was. And I found this one in LA And with this therapy that I'm doing, I'm so pulled to music, but I'm not a musician. So maybe this like musical therapy thing will do something for me. And I went and I had an amazing experience. I went into it knowing that it was going to be super white light. <laughs> and I was like, just, just put that aside. Just see what it is, what it's all about. You know, I know well, it's there's there's good, there's good things about it. It's just about balance. Yeah. Right. You know, totally. There's certainly, I, <clears throat> I can enjoy going to a Christian service, mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, and, and like you were saying earlier, um, that sense of community and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of interesting occultism happening there also, yeah. if you know what you're yeah. looking for, if you know what you're looking yeah. at, yeah. right? But no, it, it can be wonderful. It can be absolutely wonderful. But when you yeah. deny the darkness, that's when you're in trouble. Right, right. But, but same way, you and I could get kind of, off path here if we deny the light side of things as well because it's right it's just as valid absolutely but it's and, both. And yeah and i and mm. i saw that within what they were presenting and then there were aspects of it where i was like i don't even think that they realize what they're doing is accessing the primal self is is very left-hand path i don't even think that they were considering that so I'm laying there and I'm listening to these very beautiful crystal bowls and chimes and things. And I can't help myself because I'm a creative person. I'm an Aquarius. <laughs> and I'm just like, how can I make this better? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, definitely with better music. Um, because I'm somebody who like, I fucking love going to a noise show and people are just like, why do you like that? It's not even music. And it's like, I can't hardly explain it, but there's something inside of me. It makes, it makes my fucking blood boil and not in an angry way, just in a way that I feel alive. And I, I need to feel that bass in my chest and just like guttural fucking screaming. And um, it just does something for me. It, it takes me to a place that I really enjoy being. And um not that dark ambient sound bath is pure noise and screaming, although we are working on some shit like that. Um, I just thought that maybe if we utilized 
darker ambient music, we could access not only, you know, the science behind like the different hurts that are influencing somebody's mind, but even the meditations and the breath work could be more focused on looking internally instead of trying to surround yourself with some idealized version of perfection. Um, and really going for the jugular as far as the traumas that people are experiencing. Um, I've had people within the sound bath just absolutely, especially after the primal scream, they are just beside themselves and crying. And I've had to literally like go over and just hold people because I know what they're going through. I, I don't in a way because I've never actually gotten to do my own sound bath, but I've had those kinds of experiences on my own. Um, and I, I know how fucking terrifying it can be to relive that kind of trauma and to do it in a room full of other people. It's like, oh, this is fucking weird. <laughs> you well, know, we live in a culture that really um, doesn't encourage that kind of visceral experience. Right. Especially right, right yeah. now. Where, where do you get to go to just scream? You know, <laughs> like if you do it in your car, you're a fucking crazy person. But if some weirdo tells you it's okay to do it, then, you know, <laughs> yeah. then you're fine. But some people need that permission. Like we were talking about before, they just need the permission to be able to let go. Yeah, um, we, we live in such an emotionally repressed society. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, all of your emotions, right? And, and when you have, if you have rage in you, and you internalize it and you push it down you're just you're just drinking poison yeah uh, non-stop yeah. you need to let that out you need to yeah. find an outlet for it you need to get that poison out of you i like uh, uh i like the saying uh, like a good little time bomb push it down like a good little time bomb i'm like yeah. that's for sure <laughs> yeah absolutely and yeah. and you know you could you, if you have so much of that build up in you and you have an experience where you're able to let it all out in a healthy way you mm -hmm. can feel so much lighter afterwards oh, and so yeah. much just better and clearer and refocused and and re-energized because you got this poison out of you yeah that you had pushed down and we need that society needs that because it's going to come out at some mm -hmm. point yeah, and, and it'd be so much better for you to get it out in a healthy, constructive way, or or in a way in a in an environment where you're going to have support than, let's say, letting it come out at your kids or your partner or your yeah. your coworkers or, yeah. you know, you don't want that. Never that bomb goes off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I really wanted to create a space where, um, people feel safe to do that to enter that kind of headspace. Um, and I, I say that with a grain of salt because I really believe in like fuck your safe space uh, because of, of what I've done within the suspension community. I did not get into that because I wanted to feel comfortable at all. I wanted to challenge myself. And in that growth, there has to be some kind of really painful challenge. It doesn't have to be physical pain, but it will certainly be emotional. And so with that said, I want to give them a safe space to allow themselves to be unsafe. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And 100% yeah. life begins where your comfort zone ends. Mm -hmm. Maybe like you're saying, you need to provide someone with a safe space to make them realize that they don't need a fucking safe space. Right. And that this concept <laughs> of safe spaces is stupid yeah. and it's, it's detrimental to your, to your soul, yeah. to your yeah. being, because you're not safe that's right. bullshit you're yeah. not safe and you you're not to safe. Deal with that reality is not real. safe and you need to deal with that fact right right and you don't have control over everything there will be constant external forces fucking with you you can't bubble boy yourself through that you know no and there's um, no no bubble can hide you from your own internal demons either yeah. and they're there and they will they will manifest in the powerfully in the in your exterior reality Mm -hmm. if you're denying that your internal reality the internal Absolutely. always becomes external yeah you know, that's yeah. that's we, we are the creators of our own reality everything you experience is a direct reflection of yeah. your state of consciousness from moment to moment and if you're destroying your state of consciousness you're just you're, it will reflect in the outer reality and you will have a shit life yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the way it is and that's you know that's so my whole my whole thing here um my, my business motto is witchcraft for better mental health 
because mm-hmm. I want you, I want my clients, I want my students to have these confrontational experiences with the parts of themselves that they're afraid of. Absolutely. And it's liberating. And it's Absolutely. the way that is the way out of, of the existential dread. Yeah. That so yeah. many people are suffering from today. Yeah. So many of the experiences that I've had with uh, my coven of ashes, you know, I have to kind of take a step back and and look at things in a directorial and safety point of view. But I look at the experiences that these women are having that they put themselves in. And I watch them go through an amazing transformation. And it, it just brings tears to my eyes watching them go through this. And I've been through what they've been through. Um, sometimes on stage and sometimes not, but it's always an extreme challenge and you need to protect yourself and you need to check in with people. There's a lot of aftercare that goes into it, but to watch them go through this process of like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And then they do it. And it's just like their whole fucking world opens up and I get to watch that. And you get to watch them level up in that moment. And it's amazing and it's beautiful and just we're we come off stage and we're just crying because it's like, yeah, I might not have been able to get in that liminal space, but I appreciate that you were able to do that. And I always say, you know, within the troop, it's like lift others as you rise. You know, that's that's the main goal of that is to support one another. So, yeah. And and I'm sure that even if you are not <clears throat> reaching your own liminal space, the psychic energy that's being projected off the mm. off the others is is going to have an effect on you as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we we call it holding space. If there's, you know, somebody on stage that may have a very minuscule part, um they're still there holding space. You still need to be there projecting your energy into the situation. So, um every every part of it is important every person is important even if you don't reach the stage you're still lending your energy so it's just and it's really interesting to receive that energy from the audience even because they're a part of it at that point um i've done rituals where we're actually in the audience and uh people projecting their trauma onto you is is quite the mind fuck it's nothing that i was not able to handle but i definitely left my body um i was doing a a a chest to chest flesh pull um this was for a performance uh for amf and um there, I don't know if you're familiar with AMF, but they give out, um, they do like human instruments and they give out these little um, items to bang on the, the person who's pulling on their line. And so people from the audience come up and they're just hitting your, your lines attached to your, your flesh as hard as they fucking can. And this one particular instance, this individual just like dead stare me in the face and hit it as hard as he could. And, and I'm just looking at him like there was this trauma transference and I was like, I fucking feel it, dude. And then my mind just went, whoop, (laughs) like I was gone. Um, But I came out of that feeling like I not only transformed, I helped that person transform too. Absolutely, Uh, They got something out of, doing that knowing that i could handle it as a vessel for their trauma um and we've coven of ashes has done um many uh rituals about being a vessel for trauma and moving that through your body um through like transcending that through pain which is one of my favorite rituals we did in berlin was about that um screaming uh we had a we had a woman suspending in the center and the circle of women around her were screaming their responses to their trauma and that person who's hanging is just i've been in that role before and it's one of the most terrifying and amazing experiences at the same time to be open to receive um not only their trauma but their power behind uh 
getting over that trauma or moving through that trauma. And then you as the suspendee having to move that trauma through you to, you know, be that vessel and be that connector to letting that shit go into the universe. Is yeah, like, you're allowing them to transmute it through you. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, it, it hugely connects all of us and, you know, as we're like walking off stage is just people in tears because I don't think that many people get to experience that level of connection and that level of um, vulnerability that I fucking love so much. I can't say fucking vulnerability enough. It's just like that. I just get off on vulnerability. Uh, I think it's just, it's so true. It's so authentically yourself. And when you get to see people in those spaces, it's it's a magical moment. There, There's a level of trust there, or if there's no trust, there's some kind of challenge within them that they're overcoming just by being vulnerable with you. So- yeah. Well, vulner really vulnerability moving. is authenticity because you are vulnerable. vulnerable. Yeah, you are. And, and everyone has to experience, has to allow themselves to experience that. If you want to be whole, if you want to feel complete, mm -hmm. then you've got to explore all these different facets of yourself. And that's an important one. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't allow yourself to feel, you become numb to the world. And that's, you know, you, you may be attempting to to preserve your emotions or preserve your emotional state but what you end up doing is just becoming totally numb and yeah you're not and feeling it all thin. anymore yeah. yeah and before you know it too it, it happened to me yeah. uh, it's yeah. happened to me a, a couple times in my life I've, I've just fallen down that hole of, of becoming numb to the world mm -hmm. and then having to climb my way back out of it and every time it's a transformational experience but I also don't want to repeat it and I yeah. don't want to see other people going through it unnecessarily because it's, yeah. it's awful yeah yeah um, so anything we can do to help each other with that, to, to feel vulnerable and to, to be self-accepting, mm -hmm. you know, that Create, that's how you transmute these, these darknesses that are in you. Right. Creating a safe space for somebody to feel unsafe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Lauren, it's been uh, wonderful talking to you. Thank you awesome. so much for doing this. It's been great yeah. talking to you too. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh,